Um, so my background is, um, is actually working on board the ships as an expedition leader and a, and a guide on board the, um, the voyages. So I've spent nearly 20 years um, leading voyages all around the, um, around the world, including through Alaska and up into uh, to Wrangell Island, but also down in Antarctica and in the, uh, in the tropics. And um, what I want to do is just introduce um, these two des destinations in um, particular. Before we get, um, get started, uh, I've just got a, a few slides. I know a lot of you have uh, expedition crews before, but there is um, a world of, uh, of possibilities and opportunities in terms of um, small ship and expedition cruising to, um, to explore pretty much everywhere where there's, um, there's water. The unifying um, factor is that the, um, the ships are, are designed around getting you to the destination, They're giving you the, uh, the maximum opportunity, whether that's um, in the fjords of, um, of New Zealand, up and through the, uh, the, uh, the fjords of Alaska, um, or in the Mediterranean, going able to visit into uh, the small villages and towns that the uh, the larger ships are, aren't able to do. So they offer unique experiences, no matter where you're uh, you're travelling. Um, tonight we're looking at the uh, the more remote regions, um, but there are small ship cruising options through um, through the more people parts of the uh, the world as um, as well. And there's a, a broad range of, of ships, um, style and size. Um, this is the uh, probably the most powerful ship that we um, we work with. It's a nuclear powered icebreaker that can take you to the North Pole. Um, we have some really nice 12 passenger vessels that. Um, take you exploring into uh, to remote areas. Um, a lot of the, uh, the captains uh, who are on board are, are passionate about the places that they're, uh, they're travelling and taking you to um, and th throughout you'll always be really focused on the destination and the places that you're travelling to and the, the ship is the means. Um, that some of them are beautiful and luxurious, others of them are more uh, practical <coughs> and comfortable but it's always about getting you as much time in the destination on shore. People who are travelling on these types of voyages are, um, are going there to explore the, uh, the places that they're going to. You'll hear the term small ship and, and expedition cruising used interchangeably. Expedition cruising, if I have to define expedition cruising, it's defined by zodiacs or, or the tenders which are used to, uh, to take you ashore. Um, the zodiacs are a fantastic craft. Most of the drivers are also your, generally your naturalists, so they're talking to you about the places and, and the things that you're seeing and experiencing, and they're able to take you to a lot of places that um, you just simply wouldn't be able to, uh, to visit otherwise. The ships are, are excellent. The zodiacs really are the extension of the experience. They're the, uh, the key to the, uh, the destinations and they can give you some amazing experiences that you just wouldn't really be able to have any other, um, any other way. Okay, well if everyone's ready we'll uh, continue on to um, Wrangell Island and across the top of the, um, of the world and, um, and what I'm going to do is, um, is introduce you to the voyage starting from, um, from Nome. So the, uh, the ship which is, um, this expedition is going to be aboard um, is the Spirit of Enderby, which is um, a ship which was originally built for the Russian government in Finland as a research vessel. Um, it's a highly eye-strengthened vessel and it's one of the few ships which is um, capable of working up into the, the high um, Russian Arctic. It has um, been trading up in that part of the world um, for just the last few years um, since the, uh, the Russians opened up that part of the world for, uh, for visitation. and. Um, the Soviet era and, and Russia's reluctance to open its coastlines to visitation, um, not just by, over, by, by foreigners, but also by Russians themselves, has created in effect a lot of um, national reserves or national parks, which are default ones. They weren't gazetted national parks, but nobody was allowed to visit them, so the wildlife was left to, um, to do its own thing. Wrangell Island itself is actually a gazetted um, wildlife um, reserve, um, but a lot of the coastline you'll find a lot of wildlife along as, um, as well. So this is the, um, the, the, the voyage itself, starting from Anadir, which is in Chukutka, and um, crossing the, um, the Anadir Bay um, along the coast of Chukutka, going north through the, um, through the Bering Strait, and then following the coastline of, um, of Chukutka, um, which is the furthest um, eastern extension of Siberia, effectively, um, northwards, and then heading across to, um, to Wrangell Island, um, which is unique um, in its geographical position. It's unique in, um, in um, that it was during the last ice ages it's never be, it was never glaciated so because it was so um, dry um, it didn't get the build up of snow and ice that a lot of the other um, Arctic areas had um, and so it has a very unique flora about it. It was the last place that um, woolly mammoths occurred in the world because of that unique position um, and it's a fully protected nature reserve um, as, um, as well. The expedition then returns southwards following um, the same course but making different stops as it heads south along the, uh, the Chukuka coast and back to, uh, to Anadir. And how, you might ask, do you get to, uh, to Anadir? Um, to the easiest way in what we'll be doing with, um, with Karen's departure is 
organising a, um, a charter flight, so there's no scheduled services, but we do orga can organise a, um, a charter flight, um, which is what we've done for this departure, which is leaving from Nome in Alaska and then flying across the Bering Strait um, and into, uh, into Anadir where you clear Russian customs, join the ship and then, um, and then begin the voyage from there. And at the end, um, again, flying back to, uh, to Alaska, to Nome, um, to, uh, to connect with the, uh, the services there. So Nome is, uh, is sort of at the end of the, uh, the supply route in, in Alaska. Um, there's um, jet, regular jet service with Alaskan Airlines um, through to Nome, and then you, um, and what we've organised, you have a night in Nome. Um, it's a, a unique um, environment, um, unique community um, on the edge of the shoreline. They're in the middle of a bit of a, a gold rush again at the moment, so I don't know if you've um, seen, but I forget what it's called. There's actually a reality TV programme being made about all these crazy people out dredging gold off the, um, the beaches of of Nome, um, and um, it's um, it very much sort of has that gold rush feel about it. Um, but you can get out into the tundra um, around Nome very easily, and there's some great wildlife viewing um, in quite close proximity to uh, to Nome itself. The next morning, um, after you've experienced a little of uh, the nightlife in Nome, um, if you're uh, if you're keen, um, or maybe not, maybe just had a quiet night and um, and got ready for the uh, the expedition, head back to Nome Airport. And um, Bering Air is the operator of these um, these aircraft and they have a charter flight which takes you um, in about two hours flying time from Nome. You lose a day because you're going um, forward in time across the date line um, and into um, to Anadir. And um, you arrive in Anadir, the, um, this is the, the main town of Anadir, um, taken from the side of the river where the airport is. So there's a big river, the Anadir River, which um, heads in inland. Um, you'll um, clear Russian customs and have some time to explore the uh, the town of Anadir. Um, you might have come across Roman Abramovich, who is the, who is the owner of the <coughs> Chelsea Football Club. He's also for a long time was the governor of Chukutka, and he spent a lot of his own money on renovating um, Anadir as a as the town. It's the capital of Chukutka, so it's actually um, for a Soviet town very um, very well presented. Um, they've got the uh, the Russian Orthodox Church. They have a, an amazing museum um, of uh, Chukutka items. Um, that has been, um, has been built since the end of the Soviet era and you have the afternoon to explore in and around um, Anadir um, before you take the best available transport um, which is this barge um, which brings you from, the, uh, from town and out to, uh, to join the ship. Um, we are able to use Zodiacs but the Russian authorities don't allow us to use um, Zodiacs for, uh, for boarding the ship in the, uh, the river hence you get the opportunity to travel aboard a uh, genuine Russian barge in, um, in Anadir. And um, set sail from uh, from Anadir that evening. Um, continued down the um, the Anadir River across the estuary. And what I should mention, but I don't have a photo of, is almost certainly you will see beluga um, in the uh, in the channel as you um, at some stage as you um, you join the ship or um, come from town. There's a pod of, uh, of beluga that spend the um, summer in the Anadir River hunting salmon as they come and go um, up and down the uh, the river. And in many cases they'll be right beside the landing site as you're uh, as you're coming in and out of the uh, the zodiacs. The next morning is, um, is at sea, crossing the Anadir Bay, and then you um, arrive in the, um, around lunchtime at Pribazanzia um, Bay, and uh, it's the first chance to really start to appreciate some of the, the bird life, which is um, calling this coastline home. So I should say the North Pacific is, is home to a great diversity of, of seabirds. Um, in the North Atlantic, for example, there's Atlantic puffins. In the North Pacific, there's, um, there's tufted puffins, but there's also horned puffins, so there's two species of puffins. There's about 18 species of guillemots, um, murs, murrelets, um, and you start to, uh, to come across some of those species as well. So these are, are tufted puffins up on the, uh, the coastline. A spectacular um, coastline, you can see the zodiac down the, at the bottom there, and this is a big um, volcanic dike which is, um, has been eroded out of the, uh, of the rock that we're cruising along. Um, and then you start finding some of these um, auklets. This is a, a, um, a parakeet auklet that's um, breeding in the, uh, the coastline. Um, you can see them on shore on occasions. Often you'll see them up close um, as you're zodiac cruising along the, uh, along the coastline. Normally the, uh, the zodiac cruise would fi find its way um, into, um, into the river mouth, which is um, along there, and um, nice sheltered um, entry on, into, the, uh, into the tundra. Um, and you start finding these little uh, outliers of uh, the community. So a lot of families, at the end of the, uh, the Soviet era, um, Russia basically walked away from the people of, uh, of Chukutka. They'd been a very heavily subsidised 
communities living in these towns where the food was delivered every, um, every summer by the supply ship, all the fuel, the coal, and then the Soviet um, system failed and they were forced to go back out onto the land to survive. So they, um, and they still do that today even though the system is, is, is up and working again. They head out to the summer fishing camp on the river and every family has its own um, spot where they, uh, they'll go for the summer, they'll camp there. Um, they might be able to drive the truck out and the, uh, and the bike out in the winter um, or the early spring when the tundra is still frozen and then it stays there till the next winter um, because the, once the tundra is uh, thawed there's, uh, they, they can only walk and they're, um, they're salmon fishing, they're um, living a really quite traditional lifestyle in these little family groups along the, uh, the coastline. The next day you've uh, headed round into the, uh, the southern end of the Bering Strait and this is, uh, is Whalebone Alley um, and um, so there's three tribal groups that are living along the, uh, the coast of the, the Bering Strait. There's um, Siberian Yupik Eskimos, there's the Ch coastal Chukchi people and then there's the inland Chukchi people as, um, as well. But all the, the people of the peopling of the Arctic has moved through the Bering Strait at one time or another. So um, the Inuit of, uh, of Canada migrated from Siberia through the Bering Strait area and um, up into the, uh, the high Arctic. The people that built Whalebone Alley, they don't know a lot about them, but they were um, marine hunters. So these are bowhead um, jawbones that they had uh, arranged. And there's now only a small number of these um, arches which are still standing, but there was about 50 arches along the, uh, the coastline um, originally and they, um, a lot of evidence that there was um, um, traditional worship and, 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 um, and celebrations that were held in this area which is a very prime area for, for whale hunting. Um, there's still, the bowheads will have come through in the spring, um, the grey whales will be, um, will be in the area during the summer months and um, it's, um, yeah, like I say, there's not a lot known about the, uh, the people but that's looking down on um, the beach which is, um, is where Whalebone Alley is, um, is located start to uh, come across some of the, uh, the tundra specialists as well. These are uh, Arctic um, ground squirrels that uh, live in amongst the, uh, the rocks and um, you hear them a long time before you find one popped out on the, uh, on the rocks like this. Um, and and uh, you're still south of the Arctic Circle but just um, but really um, starting to get into that, that really impressive high Arctic environment. Um, only a few um, tens of metres above the, uh, the sea level um, the, uh, the mountainsides become um, effectively free of, uh, of vegetation. From uh, Whalebone Alley, normally you head further back up into the, uh, the bays and channels um, to a little island called, um, or the coastline of quite a, a little bay on a large island called Aramakitchen Island, um, where we spend the, uh, the afternoon. And again, there's a family living there. Um, this is, uh, is Ivan, who uh, who's comes with his family every um, every year. Um, he sets up his um, he's got his hut, but he also has the yurt um, that he uh, that he has for the uh, the summer. The seal hunting; those are seal skins. The salmon fishing; um, that's Ivan himself and his uh, his skin um, yurt. So Ivan is uh, is a coastal Chukchi, um, is, his, is his ancestry. And he has his, uh, his salmon fishing nets and he's um, fishing to feed the family but also his team of dogs. So he'll feed the dog team um, through the winter months on the, uh, the salmon which he's dried um, out of the fishing camp for the, uh, for the summer. And usually um, through July and August the salmon are, are running into the, uh, the rivers. These are humpback um, or, uh, or chum salmon um, but you have different species that will run. Um, usually a couple of weeks apart you'll have the, uh, the different species um, coming up into the, uh, into the rivers. If you follow uh, a little bit of a trail across the tundra for a, a short distance, you will um, not only get a good chance to experience the, uh, the tundra and some of the plant life out on the, uh, the tundra, but you'll also come to these uh, great little hot springs um, up on the, uh, the edge of the stream at the back of the, uh, the bay, where somebody has uh, taken the time to, uh, to build a, um, a hot pools um, that you can, um, can partake in I don't think I, I spared you the, uh, the photo, some photos of people in the, uh, the hot tubs, um, but there are you can go swimming in the uh, in the hot tubs, and you can uh, rush down. There's a plunge pool in the uh, in the stream. Um, you need to usually dodge the mosquitoes, um, so it's a high incentive to uh, to be in the water or uh, or moving quite quickly. But it's uh, a very much of a, a unique Russian experience to uh, to be had. Um, continuing further north, you come to uh, to Cape Dejnev, and this is the easternmost point of Eurasia. So you, at Cape Dejnev you have, uh, you've gone um, right across, the, right on the edge of the Bering Strait, sitting on, um, on, the, on the hillside at Cape Dejnev you can see America across the, uh, the Bering Strait. It's that, um, that close together. It's about 50 miles from point to point across the Bering Strait um, and you're uh, at the very end of, uh, of Asia. 
It's a spectacular, very rugged coastline. If the weather's calm, you're able to get ashore and, um, and climb up. Um, if it's not quite so calm in the middle of the, uh, the Bering Strait, um, Zodiac cruising along the shoreline. And while nobody lives at Cape Desnev any longer, um, there was uh, a very large um, community that lived there because it's right on that migration route for all the wildlife moving north into the Arctic. So they, um, they lived on the shoreline there. They, they were responsible for these similar structures to Whale, Whalebone Alley. And you can see the remains of their, uh, their houses, which would have had um, the, uh, the whalebone um, arches over the top, the skins spread across, and they're partly um, buried. So the, the ground part of the, uh, the, the pit that they would have lived in is, um, is still present. And from there, they had a great view of all the whales migrating um, north, the seabirds moving um, along the, uh, the coastline as, um, as well. Some um, really nice opportunities with the, uh, the Arctic flora that you'll, uh, you'll find that's in um, full bloom, things like saxifrage. And what you're doing is you're, you're leapfrogging north along the, uh, the coastline because you're going to come back along the, uh, the same coastline as you, uh, as you head south, but you'll be making different stops. So um, you'll, you'll jump along the coastline um, and then the next day you're up to, uh, to Kaluchin Island, um, which is where you've now crossed the, the, uh, the Arctic Circle. Um, you've moved through the Bering Strait and, um, and up into uh, much more of an Arctic environment. It's the first day um, where you realistically can be coming across polar bears um, rather than having chance to, to, uh, to see the brown bears um, which are further south on the, uh, on the coastline. And um, depending on the, uh, on the season, when the ice moves out, the bears will be hunting out on the, um, on the pack ice. They'll be living on the pack ice as long as they possibly can. And once the ice moves away or melts, they'll uh, head to shore and they'll spend the, uh, the rest of the summer on shore. They'll, uh, they'll feed where they can, but the summertime when the ice is gone is really the, uh, the worst time um, for a polar bear because they're not able to, uh, to hunt um, effectively. So these are some bears along the, uh, the coastline of Kaluchin Island. Some of them are particularly fat. Um, this one was so fat that it couldn't really walk anymore. Um, <laughs> So winter had obviously and spring had been quite good for this bear um, and I don't think um, the summer was going to pose too many problems, um, maybe just a little bit of uh, an overdue diet. Um, if there's bears ashore then usually we will leave the bears on shore and enjoy them from the, the zodiacs. Sometimes the, uh, there's no bears on Kaluchin Island in which case we're able to, uh, to land, um, walk up, there's an old meteorological base um, up on the, at the top of the island and there's some, uh, some really nice um, seabird cliffs that you're able to, uh, to look across at and, um, and photograph. Um, if, it's, um, if you're in the zodiacs, you're looking at up, and, up and across <coughs> them. If you're on land, it's generally a little bit easier for the photography because the platform you're photographing from isn't moving um, and you're uh, looking down and across at the, uh, at the bird life. So lots of uh, guillemots, there's kittiwakes um, there as, um, as well. These are the, uh, the guillemots or the murs. We've got the, uh, the horned puffins, which is the, uh, the second puffin species of the, uh, the North Pacific and the, uh, the tufted puffins, which are a little bit like the crested penguins from, uh, from down in the, uh, in the Southern Ocean. Once the, uh, the chicks have hatched, they'll be starting to, uh, to bring the fish back in. Both the puffins and the, uh, the guillemots will be bringing fish ashore um, for, the, uh, for the chicks. It's also when you start to, uh, to get into an area where you can find the, uh, the walrus falling out as, um, as well, and there's walrus endemic right through that area. Um, down in the Bering Strait itself, I haven't experienced um, walrus haulouts, but you do see them in the water um, along some of the, uh, the more marine um, areas, places like Cape Desnev, you can see them, um, see them in the water. But up at Kaluchin Island, we often find them hauled out on the, um, on the beach, and um, you're able to sometimes even get ashore with the, uh, the haulouts and um, look across at the, uh, the haulouts. So there's a couple of hundred walrus in the, uh, in the haul out there. Um, it must be horribly uncomfortable, is all I can say, having watched them um, all trying to find some comfortable position when you've got these great big tusks sticking out. If you're comfortable, your neighbour rolls over and pokes you with his tusks or her tusks, and um, life continues um, from there. But normally you can see, you can smell a walrus fall out long before you'll, um, you'll, you'll see them. Um, they're, um, and then you'll hear them and then you'll finally see them. Um, they're burping and belching and bellowing. They eat a lot of clam, so it smells like bad clam chowder when you, uh, when you smell them to, uh, to start with. Um, and, um, and then get up close with them. Generally from Kaluchin Island, the, uh, the ship will head northwards. And this is where the variability of the Arctic really comes um, to the fore. Um, We've tried to time the, uh, the expedition to um, be at a time when there's still going to be some pack ice around, 
but not so much pack ice that we're not able to go where we want to go. Um, but the Arctic is, um, is a variable uh, um, mistress and you never know exactly what you're going to, uh, to find from, from year to year. So you could find that there's quite heavy pack ice and it's, um, it's going to take the ship a while to, uh, to make its way northwards towards, um, towards Wrangell Island. Um, on other occasions there's been no ice to the, to the south of Wrangell Island and these are actually the short-tailed shearwaters that breed down around Tasmania and, the, and Bass Strait who have migrated all the way north um, and are now north of the, uh, the Bering Strait and, and feeding in the, um, in the Arctic Ocean. Ideally there's some ice but there's not so much ice that you can't go where you, uh, you want to go and this is um, approaching through the ice um, with the ship towards the, uh, the coast of Wrangell Island. So the Spirit of Enderby is um, fully ice strengthened, it's got 1A ice class, it's quite capable of moving um, through ice like this and, and ideally like I say you find, um, we'll find some of that ice still around as we, uh, we approach. If there's ice around the bears will be out on the ice in first preference. They, they're a species that is at home on the, uh, on the pack ice. Um, they will feed on the pack ice, um, that's where they can hunt seals. They go to land once the, um, once the ice has moved out of the, uh, of the area. And being in the ice with the bears is, is I think, of some of the um, some great photographic opportunities. It's really the bears in their, their natural environment um, and some great opportunities to get up close with the bears in an environment where you're able to control, the, um, control everything which is, um, which is going on. So these are taken from the, um, from the ship, looking um, across the ship, just moving quietly through the ice, um, keeping sort of loud noises to, uh, to a minimum. You'll, um, you'll find the bears behave very naturally. Um, officially there's no hunting of polar bears in, um, in Russia. Um, unofficially I can tell you, having watched a lot of polar bear behaviour, some of these bears do definitely know that humans aren't. A, um, a good thing to, uh, to get too close to. A lot of them, however, have no fear of, um, of humans as well. So each bear will, behavior will be quite individual um, and the ones which are, are more relaxed will, um, will allow some, for some great um, viewing opportunities. You're well north now of the, uh, of the Arctic Circle, so you get the lovely uh, late um, night, evening, overnight um, light um, because there's only going to be a, a very short period of time when the sun's setting at this, um, this time of the, um, the year. There's also um, opportunities to, uh, to launch, the, uh, launch the zodiacs and use the zodiacs to, uh, to head out exploring. Um, once you're down the zodiacs, you're right down at sea level, obviously, um, so you get a very different perspective, um, but you also um, are, um, are a little bit limited in how far you can, um, can see, so you're moving through the ice a little bit like the early explorers must have been in their, um, their open boats, trying to find the, uh, the wildlife, trying to find the, uh, the channels as you, uh, you make your way through, um, but it does give a, um, a different perspective. This is just Zodiac cruising um, in amongst the ice off the, um, the western side of, um, of Wrangell Island. The other thing which, um, if we're uh, fortunate enough to, uh, to find the ice around is the walrus will preferentially also haul out on pack ice until the, uh, the ice is gone. And um, this was um, from one of the expeditions I was leading a few years ago. We saw the walrus hauled out from a distance. They are um, quite skittish. Walrus don't have great eyesight, so they will um, respond negatively if there's a lot of loud noises that they're not um, familiar with. So we launched the Zodiacs quite a, um, a distance away from the um, from the walrus and then just quietly and, and slowly moved in closer and closer to the, um, to the walrus on the ice. Um, at this by this stage the motors were off, we were just drifting with the ice um, and, and slowly progressively getting them closer and, and closer um, until we were right up and amongst the, uh, the walrus that were all on these um, various flows and the, uh, the most difficult thing at that point was making sure that we didn't scare them at that point because we have a, a stampede on our hands and that's the last thing we want to uh, to do so, some uh, some absolutely um, fantastic views um, of the walrus um, hauled out. Um, really nice mixed um, group. There was a couple of hundred animals scattered around on different ice flows, um, pretty much all choosing an ice flow and filling it up until there was absolutely no way the ice flow could take any more walrus, and then the, um, obviously moved on to uh, to the next one as um, as well. 
and then slowly um, mo trying to move the zodiacs back away out of the area and, and leave the walrus to uh, to do their own thing. Afterwards, spent a couple of hours um, with the uh, with the walrus. The nice thing on the spread of Enderby is there's enough zodiacs for everybody to go out at once. So on occasions like this, um, it's really good that you can just launch the boats. Everybody's out in the zodiacs. If it's an amazing <coughs> encounter like um, like the walrus encounter, there's no rush to be somewhere else. There's no other group that's waiting to uh, to head out. Um, and you're all able to uh, to stay out for the as long as it takes, or as long as the uh, as everyone wants to uh, to be there. On shore on um, on Wrangell Island, um, there's um, there's opportunities to uh, to get out and, and, and walk on the tundra. Um, some, the south coast has some quite extensive plains, um, very long. Um, you'd be a couple of kilometres of, of walking to uh, to cover the the flat ground before you get up onto the um, onto the hills. Whereas on the east and western coastlines, you have um, the mountains coming, or the, the really hills rather than the mountains coming right down uh, to the uh, to the sea. As I mentioned, the um, the flora of, uh, of Wrangell Island is quite unique in amongst the Arctic, in that um, Wrangell wasn't glaciated, so those plants have been living there for um, for a lot longer, and it has one of the highest diversities of uh, of Arctic flora um, anywhere in the um, in the Arctic. Um, these um, purple ones are uh, last warts. Um, we have a, a gentian. And the Arctic poppies, just a, a small sample of uh, of some of the uh, the, fl the flora um, on the um, on the island. And this isn't a flower at all; it's actually a um, a feather which has got caught on an old flower. Um, but um, you're able to uh, to get out and spend really good amount of time exploring the um, the tundra um, and um, and. Um, getting up close with it so it's not just um, something that you move across, there's a lot of um, detail and I find a lot of people with the Arctic is um, it's taking the time to stop and look at the detail of the, um, of the Arctic and there's a lot, of, a lot of detail when you take the time to really um, just move slowly through the environment and look at all that's, um, that's going on under, um, underfoot. On the, uh, the southern plains is, um, is, is also one of the, uh, the best areas for, um, for seeing the, um, the musk ox and um, like I mentioned the um, Rangelone was the last place to, uh, to have mammoths and there was actually its own race of, uh, of woolly mammoth which was a pygmy mammoth um, and it's not uncommon when you're out walking on the tundra to come across uh, mammoth tusks which have been pushed up out of the, uh, the tundra by the permafrost over time. Um, there's, um, at the ranger station they have a couple of full tusks as, uh, as examples um, of, um, of the, uh, the, the, uh, the mammoth tusks but we have also found them just in the riverbeds where they've been washed out. Um, these aren't the mammoths but you sometimes sort of you could imagine that they could be the, uh, the muskox out um, grazing on the, uh, the tundra. They were actually reintroduced to, uh, to Wrangell Island in the 1940s and the herd is doing, um, doing quite well. Um, there's some nice opportunities to, uh, to get some really good views of the, uh, the muskox. Um, they're not hunted at all on um, on Wrangell Island, um, so they're really quite uh, approachable um, as you're uh, out walking on the um, on the tundra. Yes. Their um, their nearest relatives are actually um, goats. Um, well, they look more like a, a, an ox, but they um, uh, they're a relatively small animal underneath all of the fur they have. So they have this coarse outer here, and then underneath, and you'll find it out on the at the tundra. This very fine, it's amongst the finest of um, natural fibres, the kiviat, which is the under here of the uh, of the musk ox. Also out on the uh, on the tundra, there's um, there's a very healthy population of Arctic foxes. Uh, these are actually cubs at a, a den which we came across and they were out playing, um, coming out of the den and just um, playing around very, um, very playful in, the, um, in one area, not moving around a lot. Um, <coughs> obviously they don't den in the same area um, every time but um, very, um, very photogenic, um, very easy to, um, to spend a lot of time with. Um, so if you've travelled in the Arctic um, anywhere else, you will have found that you were travelling with, um, with guides who are carrying guns. One th another thing that's unique about Wrangell Island is the Russian authorities prohibit carrying guns on shore, um, which you might think is, is counterintuitive, but they have throughout the duration of the, the, um, the reserve um, prohibited carrying um, guns. They also allow you to go ashore where there are polar bears present. So if you're in Spitsbergen and you see a, um, see a polar bear on land, the Norwegian authorities insist that going ashore is putting not only yourself but the bear in danger. On Wrangell Island, the rangers will accompany you on all the landings. They join the ship when it first arrives at Wrangell and they'll accompany all the landings and they actually actively encourage you to go ashore um, on, the, uh, on, on the tundra where there are bear, bears present as, um, as well. So there won't be any guns. 
it does mean that you have to stick quite closely with the um, with the rangers um, because they're planned to uh, to protect you from bears as they carry long sticks. Um, and um, they've been doing it quite successfully for, uh, for quite some time, um, but you don't want to be wandering far from the group when the bear comes wandering over to, uh, to check you out. Um, but there will be some, uh, some opportunities to go on full day hikes on shore, um, hopefully. Um, it's always something we're looking to do. Definitely some longer um, walks away from the, um, from the shoreline and um, out into the tundra. Something else about Wrangell Island is the, uh, is the snowy owls and uh, across the Arctic as a whole, snowy owls will only breed um, where, the, where the lemmings are uh, <coughs> having a, a population explosion. So they're um, very um, time and, and spatially spread out. You can't predict where the lemming eruptions are going to be. The only place where they breed every year is on Wrangell Island. No one's really quite sure why, but every year the, the snowy owls come and, and breed on, um, on Wrangell Island. So invariably you'll come across the, uh, the snowy owls out on the, um, on the tundra, um, and there's um, a very healthy population which is, um, is present um, throughout the, um, or annually. They return to the island and um, they raise chicks each, each year as well. So like I said, there's, there's opportunities each day you're on um, or at Wrangell Island to, uh, to get ashore, to go out. Um, there'll be a range of options depending on how active you want to be, how much walking you want to do. Um, the walking is, um, because of the, uh, the situation with the bears, it's done as small groups with the, the rangers and the guides from the, uh, from the ship, um, but chances to, uh, to get ashore um, and, um, and get away from the coastline, get into the areas where, in this case, the snow geese are, um, are breeding. But also be ashore with the um, with the bears as well. And um, this is some photos from um, one of the trips I was up at Wrangell Island. Um, and in this case, we, we knew the bear was present. The the rangers were quite happy for us to uh, to go ashore. Um, they'll they'll go and they spend a lot of time on the island, so they have a very good appreciation for the behaviour of um, of different bears. And and then it's not that they'll let you go ashore with every bear, but the bears which are, are suitably settled. Um, and this bear, they were quite happy for us to be on um, on shore with. Um, so we landed, we spent um, quite a bit of time just watching the bear as it was slowly foraging along the shoreline. Um, we then headed off inland for, um, for a couple of hours exploring on the tundra, um, returned back to the shore where the bear was um, once again, and that's when we've, I've taken these photos with the, um, with the low light. Um, th by this time we're on the beach and it's just moving its way um, quietly along the, um, along the tundra edge at the, uh, the back of the beach. Some other views from um, from different encounters. This was um, one where we've um, set up on the uh, on the beach, and the bears moved along um, the uh, the shoreline. Um, it's been quite interested in the, in the group on shore, but um, has um, has just checked people out, um, mm. had a look at what's going on, and then um, continued on um, on its way, um, going about its um, its business. It's not all um, walking on the tundra. There's um, there's opportunities to uh, to zodiac cruise as well. There's some really nice bird cliffs. At, um, at Wrangell Island, um, this is one on the uh, the western end, um, where there's a lot of kitty wakes and um, guillemots or um, or murs. So these are the uh, the black legged kitty wakes, and the uh, the guillemots. In this case, they were actually out on this a little bit of ice around offshore. Um, so not only were they up on the cliffs for viewing, but they're also um, out amongst the, uh, the the ice flows off um, off the coast as um, as well. There's um, a few, in addition to sort of the more common Arctic species, there's a few unusual things. So it's quite common um, in Wrangell Island to see Sabine's gull, which is a very rare Arctic species, but does occur um, around the, the coast of, uh, of Wrangell Island. Um, I haven't seen it, but they do regularly see um, ivory gulls coming along, um, especially if the ice and the, uh, the bears are around as, um, as well. Um, I just put in some different examples of, of different encounters that I've, I've had over the years. Um, in this case, we were actually zodiac cruising and we came across a bear which was um, just slowly making its way along the shoreline. It, here it's eating the, um, the, the ice for, um, for fresh water. Um, it then um, came out and just swam quietly along past the, um, past the zodiacs. So this is from the, uh, from the zodiacs as the bear's swimming um, along. And it swam within just a few metres of, um, of the zodiacs checked us out and then continued along um, on, its, um, on its way. Off the coast of, um, of Wrangell Island there's also the, the Herald Islands, um, small islands that are only about 40 miles off the coast are the only other land um, nearby. A spectacular um, coastline for, uh, for Zodiac cruising along. There's some um, really opportunities to go ashore because it's quite a precipitous island but it's a great place to, um, 
to go um, bird viewing, you get these are uh, the pigeon guillemots. Um, you also have uh, walrus wallouts um, quite regularly. Again, you can see the walrus just behind the, um, the zodiac there in the uh, the little cove. Um, it's a uh, close-up view. So there's a large population of, of walrus. There's thousands of walrus in the Bering Strait, Bering um, Bering Sea um, area, and so haulouts of four or five hundred animals are a reasonably common occurrence around um, around Wrangell Island. The other thing I should say about the uh, the North Pacific walrus is um, they have the much larger tusks than the North Atlantic walrus. So um, the tusks on a North Pacific walrus can be up to a metre long. Um, so they're very large, um, large animals. This was um, what we came across. At, this is actually out at the uh, the Herald Islands as well. As we came across bears, and, and so in the winter months, they'll be they'll be the females will den when they're having cubs. Um, this isn't a female coming out of her den, but it's a, a young animal that's making use of those dens um, in the springtime, early summer, and the snow banks along the, um, along the coast of, uh, of Herald Island. So photographing from the, uh, from the zodiacs um, up to the, uh, the bears is along the, uh, the shoreline. So you have um, five days at Wrangell Island, and each day is, um, is dictated a little bit by the, the weather and the ice, um, but making use of, uh, of the ship to move around the coastline and explore different areas at, um, at different times. Um, from Wrangell Island you then um, head southwards and you follow the coastline of, uh, of Chukukka southwards again. And it's actually not far from Kaluchin Island, which you remember we passed on the way north, is um, Kaluchin Inlet. And um, that's a great area for uh, seeing a lot of the, uh, the birds of the, the wet um, high tundra. So you can um, explore across all these um, channels and, and very low-lying areas. Um, really nice opportunities to see some of the things that are, are breeding on and around those um, those wetland areas. Um, things like the uh, the loons, white-billed loon, which is uh, quite an uncommon species. Um, great diversity of uh, of birds which are making their way north to uh, to Arctic Russia. Uh, this is a, a Dunlin, I believe. It's coming out of its um, breeding plumage. Um, but there's about 20 species which are moving <coughs> to Chukutka um, to, uh, to breed each summer. Now, the chances of seeing all 20 species are, uh, are slim, but you'll definitely see a, quite an interesting diversity of, of these birds, which when a lot of them are even coming all the way down to Australia to winter, and they look a little bit drab and boring um, when they're in their winter plumage. But when you see them in their breeding plumage, um, waders and uh, shorebirds make a whole lot more sense. Uh, these are uh, emperor geese which are unique to just that end of, uh, of Russia and um, quite a, uh, an endangered species. You can um, come across um, all sorts of unusual things as you're uh, exploring around. These are uh, wolverine tracks which um, are um, a rather elusive um, mammal and if you're really lucky you'll even come across wolverine um, out foraging and um, it definitely doesn't happen every voyage but we have um, seen them on a, on a reasonably regular basis, the, uh, the wolverine um, and they're probably one of the harder mammals of the, uh, the Arctic to, uh, to come across. We always try to, uh, to visit Yulin, which is one of the, uh, the communities along the coastline. And during the Soviet era, the Soviets actually moved all the, uh, the traditional artists of, uh, of that part of um, Shukutka together into one community, which was Yulin. So Yulin's really become the center for um, traditional Chukchi art, um, a, a very strong center for Chukchi um, culture as, um, as well. I have a, um, a welcome from the, uh, the local people. Might even get involved if you're uh, feeling particularly uh, energetic. Um, you're able to appreciate some uh, traditional Soviet architecture um, because they, these towns were um, Soviet implants, so the, uh, the small apartment blocks, very um, Soviet style, although the people themselves who are living in the communities are living a really um, quite traditional um, lifestyle. Um, in Yulin they have a, uh, have a museum and a um, chance to go back to, uh, to school um, maybe or just a chance to see some of the art which they produce. And, um, the main art form of the, uh, the Chukchi and, and the Siberian Yupik Eskimos is, um, is ivory carving and they do that in two forms. They, this is uh, the scrim which they do onto the walrus ivory um, so they have quite intricate designs that they'll design along the uh, length of the, um, the tusks and they also do this um, relief carving as, um, as well and um, really very fine, um, fine artwork which they're doing. Unfortunately for, uh, for us in this part of the world it's very difficult, if not impossible, to, uh, to bring it back um, but it is something that you are able to, uh, to really appreciate um, 
what they're able to, uh, to do. And they have artwork um, or carving going back to the 1950s and 60s in the museum and you're able to see the work that they've produced over the years um, in Newland. And you wander down the, uh, the main street and you might find they've been out um, seal hunting. They do whale hunt on a regular basis um, as well in, um, along the coast of the Bering Strait, um, predominantly for, uh, for grey whales. And it might not be why you're uh, heading to the Arctic. You might want to appreciate the whales as, as they are, as, um, as uh, swimming around in the ocean. But uh, for me, it's a great insight into um, the other side and, and the culture of the, uh, the people which are living there. Because when a whale is brought up on the beach, it's not sort of uh, um, small event, the whole of the community turns out, the little old ladies come down with their bucket to get their, their quota of, uh, of whale blubber and, and whale meat, the kids will be eating blubber as they slice it off the, um, off the whales and um, in very short order a, a grey whale will uh, be distributed amongst the community um, and there will just be the, uh, the bones left on the, um, on the beach. Right out in the, uh, the middle of the Bering Strait is, um, is big and little Diomede and it's the closest that the, that the two um, superpowers come to each other. Big Diomede is Russian, little Diomede is American and there's just over a nautical mile separates the two of them. Um, so in that picture there, that's big Diomede that the Zodiacs are going towards and the island behind is little Diomede which is America. So um, you have to be very careful that you don't Zodiac cruise inadvertently to the other side of not only the date line but also um, to cross into, uh, into American territory. The, uh, the Americans have a, um, a small village on, um, on Little Diomede of, um, of Yupik Eskimos. Um, the Russians have a KGB or an FSB station to, uh, to watch the world and, um, and they watch us very closely but they do allow us the Zodiac cruise um, along the, uh, the coast of, uh, of Big Diomede and you can see the this watching station. There's usually five men with guns um, standing there and watching the, uh, the world go by very seriously. Um, I think they've been posted to the very ends of Russia, so they've probably misbehaved somewhere, but they're, ta they're taking the biggest opportunity they can to uh, redeem themselves. The, uh, the reason we go there isn't for, um, for watching the, the Soviet border guards, it's to, uh, to see the wildlife, and it's smack bang in the middle of the Bering Strait, so there's a great um, abundance of, uh, of seabirds. You've got the, uh, the puffins again, um, these are all from the photograph from the, uh, from the Zodiacs. Um, these are tiny little least auklets, which are about the size of a, a blackbird, um, and they're the smallest of all the auklets, and you'll find them out at sea um, as, um, as well. And um, just a, a nice view of the, uh, the coast as the sun sets. You frequently see the grey whales. I haven't got any photos um, from my trips that I've put in tonight, but we regularly see grey whales along that Chukutka coastline um, as, um, as well. So a little bit more about the, um, about the Spirit of Enderby, it was, um, as I said, it was originally built as a research vessel, um, so it's purpose built for going to the polar regions, it's fully ice strengthened, it was built in Finland for the Russian um, government, and it's still a Russian um, flagged vessel, the crew on board, the captain and the, and the engineers are, uh, are Russian, um, and that allows the ship uh, unrivaled access along the Russian um, coastline to, uh, to visit a lot of the smaller um, communities and, and out of the way areas that the, um, the larger vessels and the non-Russian ships don't have uh, permission to do. It's not an icebreaker but it's fully ice strengthened for um, navigating through ice so it is able to navigate through very heavy Arctic ice um, and take you up in, in amongst the, the ice for the, um, the best of the experiences. Where you um, live on board are the places where the scientists would have um, would have lived when the ship was originally designed, um, lived and worked, I should say. This is the bar library area. Originally, that was the uh, the science lab on board, um, and the ship would have been doing oceanographic research. But that's been converted into um, into a, a cosy um, bar library area um, on board. One of the most popular public areas on board the ship. It isn't one that was designed to be a, as such a, a, originally at all. It's actually the bridge, and there's an open bridge policy, so you can head up to the bridge any time. Um, the officers and the captain are very happy to uh, to see everybody um, coming and going from the uh, from the bridge day and night. It's a great spot for uh, for wildlife viewing and just to see the ship in, in action as um, as well. Dining room on board, and um, while it's a, a Russian ship, don't worry, you won't be um, fed um, wash all the time. Um, all the uh, the provisions actually come on board when the ship is in New Zealand. Um, so you have prime New Zealand um, produce on board, and then it's just the uh, the fresh produce which is brought on um, when the ship's up in um, in Russia. And Australian and New Zealand chefs, so you get very well fed. Um, you get a little taste of uh, of Russian cuisine, but you're very well uh, looked after during the uh, the time on board. 
there's a range of different um, cabin categories, um, and the, the cabins where the scientists would have originally been um, accommodated. So this is the uh, the suite on board, which is the uh, the largest um, of the uh, the cabins. Um, there's, then there's a um, a superior plus cabin, which has two lower berths and a um, and a private bathroom. Um, the superior cabin has uh, has bunks, so an upper and a lower berth plus a, it has its own private bathroom. And then you have um, these cabins, which are um, the main deck cabins. So they have two lower berths, a wash basin in the cabin, and a toilet and shower is, um, is shared in the corridor. And I have to say, I, when I'm on board leading the voyages, um, I live on the main deck. And while it's very nice having a, having a bathroom in, in the cabin um, with you, I've never had any issues with getting into the showers and the bath and the toilets on the main deck if, um, if I'm living down on that level. Um, there's plenty to, uh, to go around, so that's a, a very good option for those looking for that type of uh, accommodation as well. So the, um, the voyage with, um, with Karen and, uh, and Damien is um, for next year, um, leaving from Nome on the 31st of July, returning to Nome on the 15th of August. It does get confusing because of the international dateline. Um, so you lose a day and you gain a day as you go backwards and forwards across the dateline. But those are the dates to and from Nome. So that removes all the, the days you are and aren't on the, the crossing the, uh, the dateline. And um, that price includes the, uh, the charter flight to get you from um, Nome across to, uh, to join the ship in, um, in Anadia and back again, as well as the, uh, the cruise price as, um, as well. And there's a range of, uh, that's the um, main deck price, and then there's a range of, uh, of cabin categories that um, you can talk to the team about and, um, and um, look at the different options from there. So that's uh, a little introduction to a, a Wrangell Island expedition. Um, of course, if anyone's got any questions now or afterwards, then you're uh, more than welcome to talk to myself or uh, any of the team here at Backtrack.